As a black box tester, I've never found structural tools helpful. There are better kinds of coverage to work with as a black box tester. Years ago, I was managing development of a new release of a desktop publishing program. The vice president of development asked me what code coverage our testing had achieved. I said I didn't know. She asked again a few days later, and I said, these are system testers. They don't really use that tool. She looked disappointed, and I said, here, if you want to look at tracking progress, we have to pass compatibility testing with about 80 printers. We're a desktop publishing program. We have to work with them. At the moment, we work with 10. What I'm worried about today is, when are we going to work with more printers? After that, the VP stopped asking me how many lines of code we tested, and she asked how many printers worked. Percentage of printers is just as good a coverage measure as percentage of statements. Another important coverage measure for us on that project involved a long list of word processors and graphics programs. Our advertising said that we could read data from any of them, so we had to test all of them. Another problem that we had to worry about was that many programs on our platform had problems reading or writing files that were exactly two to the n bytes long. So we wanted to test every type of file that we wrote at every one of the sizes that we were worried about. So here are three types of coverage that have nothing to do with structural coverage. Device compatibility coverage, input file format coverage, and output file format and size coverage. Their coverage, because we can figure out how many tests we want to run, and then we can figure out what percentage of those tests we've covered so far. Brian Merrick is one of the early authors of code coverage tools. He wrote a well-known open source code coverage monitor for programs written in C. Then he was hired as a consultant to write the kernel for many commercial coverage tools. He also consulted the companies who use these tools. And he wrote about the problems that he saw while he was consulting in a classic paper called How to Misuse Code Coverage. When you measure someone's performance, they do things that make them look better according to that measure. If you count how many statements someone has tested, they'll add tests to cover more statements. That doesn't mean they'll make good tests. Coverage doesn't measure how powerful the tests are. It's going to measure how many statements they've touched. What Brian saw was that companies would tell their programming staff to write tests that achieved 90% coverage. So they would. But the tests weren't necessarily any good. People shifted focus from writing powerful tests to writing tests that gave good coverage numbers. So they might have more tests, but in the process they might find fewer bugs. Measuring code coverage is a lousy way to tell how close you are to being done. Putting pressure on people to increase their coverage numbers is a lousy way to drive toward completing a project. Knowing that you've achieved 90% branch coverage doesn't tell you how thoroughly you've tested or how good the product is. That doesn't necessarily make branch coverage a bad thing to use, though. It only makes it bad for the purpose of deciding how close your testing is to being complete. A different use of code coverage is to identify areas of the program that you haven't tested yet or have tested only lightly, not for status reporting purposes, but to figure out whether you want to test that and how. Testing from the outside, it's easy to miss things. There are plenty of reports of coverage measurements showing that a project's test plan reached only 35% of the code. When you identify the 65% that you've missed, you can design tests to plug the gaps that you consider important. That's what coverage is good for. Well, that's it for today. Next time, we'll take our work on coverage down a little different path. We're going to look at estimating the number of tests we can run under various circumstances. And of course, we're going to confront again the impossibility of running everything.